Sorry? Huh? I need to put a link? No, no, no. If we can um, Give us get a link. Yeah. I think it's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. And I don't have a Facebook account. <laughs> so. Neither do I. Okay. You can, he, I'll find he, it. He'll, he'll help you. He's, he's our face. He's the church Facebook like, guru. He's, he's the one, definitely. <coughs> I'm Andrew. Nice to meet you. 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 Nice Canonical books, some of the fathers did not consider them inspired, but they are uh, having history and events that are for our edification. As we learn from the book of Tobit that we read, uh, and um, Friday before the final Friday of Lent, the book of Judith is the, um, another delivery uh, from the hand of uh, people who are going to capture Israel and capture Judah afterwards and it, it puts historically the book into um, the period of uh, when the northern empire has fallen into the hand of the Assyrians and they actually gave them the land because they knew what they would do to the countries that would resist them and then the southern empire which is Judah would be um, resisting so, in the middle of the writing, when we, did, when we read before in chapter 7, uh, we find that the writing puts us into a space where this is after the, after the captivity. After the captivity means that both of Israel and Judah had fallen, and the temple is raised and demolished, and that will put us in a completely different time. So, the only reconciliation we can do with this, so are we at the time of 2 Kings 18 and 19 where God defended Judah against the attack of the Assyrians? Or are we at the time where the temple has fallen already and it has been raised already and now there is the return from captivity and rebuilding and then another attack happened? This is, the second one is unlikely, but because the book is written after both of them, so probably the writer of the book, which is probably one of the Maccabees, has put an event that's coming later in the former context in order to tell us how God defends, uh, how God defends his people. Oh. In the book of Judith, uh, this is where we, second canonical books may have historical confusion. So technically, as the writer is writing, sometimes he puts the events of the book in this period, which is defending the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel had fallen. But he also tells us in the middle that when people, when the temple was demolished completely, which is after Judah had fallen, and people returned, it's because of the belief of God they are coming to rebuild. And he, he put this just to show Without support of God, nothing, nothing will happen. I'm not doing the book of Judas, you know, specifically who did, and it's not in the, in the regular writings. Uh, but the beautiful thing about Judas is she's a lady, and she will do exactly what David has done to Goliath. Um, and from chapter 1 to chapter 7 is showing the power of Satan, under uh, Satan is whole of fairness, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar. So he puts Nebuchadnezzar with the Assyrians, you know that Nebuchadnezzar, is with the Babylonians. There are two opinions about this, is that he's still, the, the, the people are called the Assyrians, although they are defeated by the Babylonians, or the term Nebuchadnezzar actually is like Pharaoh. It's just a generic name for whoever is ruling in this area, in Mesopotamia. And that's why the, the, these books, the second canonical, could be historically, um, you, you don't know where to pin, pinpoint them exactly. Um, also, Ezra, when he collected the books from 
after captivity, this is in the book of Nehemiah and in the book of Ezra, there is no mention of the book of Judas. So Ezra collected the books after the return from captivity. So this means that the book was written after that, but it talks about events that's before that. So we have three, three points. The point of what's happening, the point of the captivity, Sebi, and going back to rebuild the temple, which is the Haggai and Nehemiah, and then the point of writing Judas, or to your side, at the time access goes this way. So the kept, in 2 Kings 18, 19, the Lord is delivering by an angel against St. Kareb, or against uh, Rabshaki, who was trying to defeat Judah. And then after this comes the captivity and uh, three invasions happen to Jerusalem and then everybody is captured to Jerusalem, uh, captured to, to Babylon. And then after this, the Maccabees. So the book is written on the time of Maccabees because Ezra didn't mention anything about this book. And Ezra is in the time of the return from captivity, which is the same as Nehemiah and Haggai, Haggai and the, the The most logical is that as the writer is writing, he's seeing how God supports us in this and puts it here, just to show generally God's support. And that is, that is um, not very common because it's confusing historically, but it's common to, for a writer was trying to show how God is supporting his people to take an event from here and put it there, and that's, that created some confusion. Um, most probably, because it, because it mentioned Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah over three times. He did not defeat it, defeat it right away. It seems that between the first and the second and third invasion, or between the second and the third, Probably it could be the time of, of Judas. Because it matches that Israel fell, Mamlakat Israel where Israel fell, but Judah is there. And that's what matches that the Assyrians could not invade Judah and Nebuchadnezzar is the one who did it. Second reason for this is that there is no mention of any king in Judah. The king who was captured, Yahuyakim is after the first invasion, so maybe in the second and the third invasion when there is no king, there was this defense by Judas against more of the taking of the, of, of the kingdom of Judah. So in summary, in summary, we favor that the events that happened is when there is two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. Israel fell to the Assyrians. They tried to invade Judah. They, they failed. That's the, in 2 Kings 18 and 19, which is Hezekiah was the king at that time. Um, and then the Babylonian Empire defeated Ashur, defeated the Assyrians. So they are coming now to take Judah, Babel, headed by, headed by Nebuchadnezzar. So he invaded and he was able to defeat it first time. And then over the next two times, that's probably when this book has taken place because there's no mention of a king, maybe he was taken captive already, Yahuyakim. And there is now valiant defense uh, against, um, against the, them. It's not mentioned in the book that they are coming again to do it. So it, it makes it really, it makes it really um, confusing when he mentions there is captivity and the temple was demolished. The temple is demolished after, after the Nebuchadnezzar completely demolished Jerusalem. So in, in his, the historical mixing of things is a little bit, makes it, where do you want, where, where can you put it? The idea of the book is that even if you don't put it historically, and that's why this is, this is some of the accounts why these books are considered not from the mainstream of the Bible, but considered second canonical is that what's in it is not a fairy tale, it's an event that happened, but the way of writing is, is not like an inspiration. It it's, it's really supports some mistakes in the transcription or in the writer lumping things that he shows the hand of God and he takes it from this event and puts it in this event. So it makes us, when is the book exactly happening? So. Um, and, and we said before, the people who hold on to the Bible only and just feel it's like a book coming from heaven should not have any mistakes in transcription. Um, some of them actually do into PhDs in the Bible and the transcripts. Uh, they actually could, could become atheists because they are shocked that the Bible may have mistakes. How is it inspired by God and it has mistakes? But it's very, it's very understood by people who are using manuscripts it could be transcription manuscripts, it could be the writer is lumping things because he writes it too much after the fact. 
puts this or this because the moral message is God takes care of his people so he takes this event and lumps it as he's writing this event uh, and as we said most probably it was written by one of the Maccabees which is the last era before the coming of Christ that's the beauty of finding I don't want to say mistakes in the Bible but things that you de debate where do you want to put the book um, but it doesn't change the fact that it's a book that where God shows that uh, he will give victory in the weakest moment. So when you go home, read Judas from 1 to 7, we'll go, this is the period of humiliation, the period of Holofernes, who is the leader of the um, uh, army of Nebuchadnezzar, is just showing um, there is no God in any country, because God is Nebuchadnezzar who will defeat this. And when Ashur told him, by the way, these people you're going to, God opened the Red Sea in front of them, they defeated all the nations, and the only way you can defeat them is, their God, is if their God is upset with them. Well, the furnace was so upset with Ashur, and he told them, you, you know what, tie him down, put him there, because I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him as I'm invading Judah, just to show him um, that, that there, is no, there is no one except uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who is God that needs to be worshipped, Nebuchadnezzar the king. So they are, um, they are now in, in a place called Bethulia, which is one of the um, cities at the edge of the kingdom of Judah, Bethulia, or Beit Khului in Arabic. Um, and the advantage of the, of the, of the topography, the Tadaris, of this area is uh, in order to get an army in, there is narrow passages in the mountains, and it, takes on, it gets only one or two people to go through. So they designed that they are going to block these, uh, these uh, narrow passages, and that will make them able to uh, sustain a little bit. But Holofernes is coming with 100,000, maybe 150,000, and horses and all of these to invade. So the, the, humanly, there is no chance, but they will do their part. And uh, they said, you know, uh, oh, Pelofernes resorted to, to stop the water completely coming from into the city. And this way, they're going to die within four or five days. So they give now, an, uh, um, they give now a decision that if, if we don't have the water for the next five days, we're going to give in to Pelofernes. The devil has won, basically. And that's, that is um, the beauty of how, when it comes into the, the, the three holy youth, the, the, the furnace ignited seven times, even to the point people who were igniting it died. But to the children of God, it was actually a due, and it's a reason or a, 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 a evidence that God will deliver his children even from a fiery furnace that's ignited seven times. And that the fire was real because it burned those who are, uh, who are doing it. So now they are in the period of the five days that if, it, if the situation stays the same, we're going to die of thirst anyway. So let's just give in to Holofernes because uh, here it is the The children were listless and the women and young men fainted from thirst and were collapsing in the streets of the town and, and in the gateways. They no longer had any strength. Then all the people, the young men, the women, and the children, this is chapter 7, just to put us into the context, gathered around Uzziah and the rulers of the town and cried out with a loud voice, Uzziah is a ruler, not the king. They gathered around him as a reputable person and said before the elders, Lord, let God judge between you and us.
give a token to Uzia, Uzia, sorry, that, and then let us hold out for five days more. By that time, the Lord our God will turn His mercy to us again. I don't know where we get this confidence, but this is God likes us to talk to Him in this way, in the humility, but in trusting His hope. Will turn his mercy to us again, for he will not forsake us utterly. But if these days pass by and no help comes from us, for us, I will do as you say. Then he dismissed the as you say means let's give him to all of fairness. Then he dismissed the people to their various posts and the posts on the these passages to protect it, and they went up on the walls and towers of their town. The women and children he sent home because there was a gathering what to do about this. In the town they were great in great misery. Now we'll see now how God will use Judas. Now in those days Judas heard about these things. She was the daughter of Merari, son of Ox, son of Joseph, son of Orziel, son of Hedekiah, son of Ananias, son of Gideon, son of Raphael, son of Ahitub, son of Eliajab, son of Hilkiah, son of Eliab, son of Nathaniel, son of Shalmael, Salamiel, son of Sarah Sadai, son of Israel. Is there a Jacob? We don't know that we know that there is none of the children of Israel is called Sarah Sadai. So in intra text this is a Vatican it says here Sarah Sadai son of Simeon son of Israel. So it could be head, the head of the of the tribe after Simeon, like the old person who headed, and that's why it's mentioned him instead of Simeon. So these are things that you can see in many scripts could be different. And I don't know, maybe if you leave the page. I think it's there. It's there? Oh. There is. I just pressed another tab. Yeah, there is no, there is two. Uh, it still shows it, yeah. Let's, let's delve into the beauty of this lady. Um, actually, she's physically beautiful, and internally she's even much, much better. How her heart is with God. Her husband Manasseh, who belonged to her tribe and family, had died during the barley harvest. For he had, for as he stood overseeing those who were binding sheaves in the field, he was overcome by the burning heat and took to his bed and died in his town Bithuya, which is the town we're in. So they buried him with his ancestors in the field between Dothan and Balamon. Dothan is the city where actually the children of Israel conspired, sorry, the sons of Joseph conspired against him when they saw him coming from a distance in Genesis 37. He told the father that they are in Shechem, he went to Shechem and the person told them that he went to Dothan, which is lying to Jacob. And that's a symbol of the Pharisees, how they are lying to, um, in their honest service to God. And when they conspired to deliver Joseph uh, and to kill him, this is uh, again the conspiracy to kill Christ. And they ended up selling him. And Christ was killed by his own brethren. To his own he came and his own refused him, as mentioned in St. John chapter 1. So, so Dothan clicks in the mind right away. This is a place where there is a lie and a murder, plan for murder happened. And Reuben, in fact, uh, said, put them in the well. He was hoping to deliver him later. Um, but then when he came back, he found that they sold him to the Egyptians. Um, and then Egypt became a symbol of Satan that captures uh, the people till the exodus happens and they go back to the promised land. Why there is a land, why there is a congregation, how does the congregation fit in the land? This is all um, of how how the how the Bible start, the Bible is, is put into a certain context, whether it's the paradise or the old testament or the salvation. They, they have a certain context that I don't know get into today uh, we did it in the yesterday I'm understanding the faith in So the, the, the events of Dothan are events of lying and events of lying to the Father, events of plan and plot to deliver Christ, to deliver, sorry, Joseph. 
and saying that the beast ate him, that beast symbolized to, uh, symbolizes Pilate because they use Pilate to kill Christ um, and they lie to the father. Um, they are just trying to say that we're innocent. They told the disciples, don't bring his blood on us when St. Peter and St. John were preaching in Acts 3. Well, you're the ones who said his blood is on us and our children. Don't preach this name here. And they, they, were, they, they scourged them and they felt very honored and they scourged for Christ's sake. Disciples now are very, very, no denial, no fear. They love that they are receiving insults for the sake of Christ. Judas remained as a widow for three years and four months at home where she set up a tent for herself on the roof of her house. She put sackcloth around her waist and dressed in widow's clothing. She fasted all the days of her widowhood except the day before the Sabbath and the Sabbath itself. The day before the new moon and the day of the new moon and the festivals and days of rejoicing of the house of Israel. So the breaking of the fasting on feast days. She was beautiful in appearance and was very lovely to behold. Her husband Manasseh had left her gold and silver, male and female slaves, livestock and fields, and she maintained this estate. No one spoke ill of her, for she feared God with great devotion. Very beautiful lady, a widow, wear sackcloth, honoring God, fasting all, all week long, breaks the fasting only on feasts, and she's extremely beautiful. When Judas heard the harsh words spoken by the people against the ruler, against the ruler Hosea, because they were faint for lack of water. And when she heard all that Uzziah said to them and how he promised them under oath to surrender the town to the Assyrians after five days. The town is called Bethulia. She sent her maid in charge of all she possessed to summon Uzziah and Shabris and Charmis, the elders of her town. They came to her and she said to them, let's listen to this. Listen to me, rulers of the people of Bethulia. What you have said to the people today is not right. She has no idea what she will do. She's starting by correcting the leaders because they are going to plan to give in to Holofernes. You have even sworn and pronounced this oath between God and you, promising to surrender the town to our enemies unless the Lord turns and helps us within so many days. Who are you to put God to the test today and to set yourselves up in the place of God in human affairs? This is really very, very, very touching. The amount of closeness to God that this lady had. She didn't know what she would do. She didn't know how God would deliver. But she's telling them, how could you promise to deliver the city to the enemies? Of course, these enemies are famous what they do to the cities. And they're saying that there's no other God. You are putting the Lord Almighty to the test. But you will never learn anything. So it, let us not have a contractual relationship with God. Like if he does this, I'll do this. It's different than a vow. But the three holy youths, their strength, and that's, I'm glad that we're, on, we're honored by, by their names in the church that they, they even told Nebuchadnezzar, even if we die in the furnace, he's still the true God. Like they did not say he will deliver us. He will deliver us. And if he doesn't deliver us, he's still true God. There's no, there's no God has to prove himself to us. Because uh, what he did on the cross is enough. Is enough. Is enough for every person for the rest of their life. That just, that he saves us from eternal presence in front of Satan. So you will not get any experience with God if it's, if the relationship with him, if I do good, then he must pay me back. I will not learn about God. I will not get to the depths of God. I will just be like um, 
missing out on this beauty. You cannot plumb the depths of the human heart or understand the workers of the human mind. How do you expect to search out God, omit all these things, and find out his mind or comprehend his thought? No, my brothers, do not anger the Lord our God, for if he does not choose to help us within these five days, he has power to protect us within any time he pleases. Don't put him in a timetable, or even to destroy us in the presence of our enemies. Still he is God. He can do whatever he wants. We were destroyed in Egypt, but then he brought us back. Do not try to bind the purposes of the Lord our God, for God is not like a human being to be threatened, or like a mere mortal to be won over by pleading. In this sense means it's it's not about I'm gonna glorify God because I need something from him. This is what it says. That you just uh, kiss up to somebody in order to get, get him to do something for you. God is not like this, God sees the heart. He wants you to glorify him. That's why the Akbaya is amazing because the Akbaya is all the requests in it are spiritual. Facilitate our life is at the very, very end, but everything is our glory, thanksgiving, humiliation, humility, deliverance. It's the right material to talk to God with. So he gave us a script that, that, he, that should become my language and my relationship with him. And then leave, leave my request to the end. Have my own personal prayer at the end. There's no problem. In fact, that's very, very encouraged to have your own prayer. But after that, after we have addressed God, it's like when you raise matins and you do the liturgy of the word, before you start turning to him and and telling him we can't wait to, to, to have communion. And here is, we as believers or penance or people who are eligible to attend the rest of the liturgy, we're going to, to unite with you in the flesh later on. Therefore, while we wait for his deliverance, let us call upon him to help us. And he will hear our voice, if it pleases him. If it pleases him, means if our heart is, is with him. And, and in the timing also that pleases him. Very often, very often I would expect something from God and if it doesn't, didn't happen, one would feel abandoned or God doesn't love me as much or look what he gives to this person and he's like, look at his lifestyle and sticking to him, I don't get anything. So it becomes transactional relationship. God bears with this because he knows, he is even told that the, the Pharisees when the one that, that if you blaspheme against the Son of Man, it, it's forgiven. Blaspheme against the Holy Spirit means if you call my miracles to be done by the spirit of demons, that's blasphemy. And God for mana khalas, He prevented this because all of the works of the apostles later on and the sacraments or the graces, the heavenly graces, will be done by the Holy Spirit. So if we have doubted that this is the Spirit of God and we have any involvement of Satan, God called this blasphemy. The second type of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the Gdif Aruch HaKobos, is if I refuse the work of God, which none of you does, thank God, till the person dies, that refuses to, 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 to be working with God. But by God's grace, none of us in this condition. For never in our generation or in those um, Present days has there been any tribe or family or people or town of ours that worships gods made with hands, as was done in days gone by. That was why our ancestors were handed over to the sword and to pillage. And so they suffered a great catastrophe before our enemies. But we know no other god but him. It's amazing. I mean, this, she has money. She has youth. She has beauty, she has everything. She's not living up her life. She's actually correcting the whole city. Exactly David, but in the female version. When he goes there and sees Goliath ridiculing them, what's going on? He cannot stand it. He has to do something. And everybody's like shivering. And you just, are you coming to make fun of us? No, I, I just can't stand it. I'm gonna do something, okay? He's dying anyway. So, but, but this is, at least he had an army, <laughs> there's, there's hope. But, but Judith is in a much, much more precarious condition. 
And so we hope that he will not disdain us or any of our people. For if we are captured, all Judea will fall, and our sanctuary will be plundered, and he will make us pay for its desecration with our blood. See now, so this means that the temple is still erected. He cannot have this still. So this puts us that Nebuchadnezzar has not yet demolished the temple. This, like, this resistance maybe he comes later and demolishes it. In any case, as we said, there might be inaccuracy in putting the timing because it lumps two events together. The events of the captivity and the temple desecrated and the event before the captivity and the writer is after both of them and to teach us that we have to stick to God, he puts them together. This is possible. The slaughter of our kindred and the captivity of the land and the desolation of our inheritance, all this he will bring on our heads among the nations, wherever we serve as slaves. And we shall be an offense and a disgrace in the eyes of those who acquire us. That's just, that, that just shows it's before the captivity because she's not talking about it as a past tense. Past tense. What threw us in is the verse in chapter 7 when it was 18 and 19 that about raising the temple and demolishing it. And I keep repeating that is the right around lumping something later on, putting it in the context of deliverance. And it, it, it confuses the time. But from what Judith is saying, that, that, that they are not yet in the hands of the enemy. For our slavery will not bring us into favor, but our Lord, our God, will turn it into dishonor. That's what happened at the time of Tobit. If you bury the dead, you're in problem with the king. And in the time of Daniel and the three holies, you have to eat this food because, because this, uh, but the food is illegal to us. No, the, only Daniel and the three holies didn't. Um, and the result was to be thrown in the fiery furnace or to be thrown later on under the Persian Empire. Then it was thrown to the lions. But they were honored. <clears throat> the reason, they were honored to the point that the, the standard of living of the Jews in the Persian Empire was so high that caused the problem in Haggai's, when Haggai was trying to bring them back to build the temple. Everybody was living like on the beach, was living very, very comfortable. We're going to go back to the dump and try to build it. So he has four processes in these two chapters of the book of Haggai, Sefer Haggai. The first one, the Lord, the, the voice of the Lord came to Haggai, who tells to Zerubbabel, uh, son of Shabtail, and to um, <coughs> Yehuzah, son of Yehuzadak, Joshua. Son of, Tell these people, you're living in penned houses, and you're leaving my house in ruins. In Tashim Fibut, Fakhma Gitta, Musaibin Bit Mahdum, living in penned. So you're going to gather, and you'll not have blessing. Your pocket will have holes in it. You will not have any blessing whatever you're gathering. And then they came back and built, and then three other three other prophecies came because and it's amazing this book is a short book, but it has the prophecies are like three and a half months span. But the, we, we did it here before a while ago, and it's just amazing mean, 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 uh, meaning on how to build yourself. And when you start building, the devil tells you, oh, this house will not look as beautiful as, the, as before. So another prophecy comes and says, this house is going to be more beautiful. I will come to this house. And God is encouraging those who are building, don't lose hope because the older people told them, and this house, it's like, have you seen the old temple, the previous one? This is nothing compared to it. Which is the devil tells you, whenever you repent, you'll never go back to the way you were in, in, in elementary or junior high. The purity you had then, no matter what, you can never become again the same person. And that God says, no, you can even become better. So, I, I can't emphasize enough the beauty of the Old Testament and I'd rather call it the law and the prophets and the captivity and the return. So the word old makes it like it's op optional. It was so important that the Lord quoted it and that the church lived with the law and the prophets and the sacraments without the New Testament. The church functioned so strongly, the era of the apostles, there was no New Testament, at least for the beginning part. So the, the, the law and the prophets were enough to give Christ his due value and to, to, to do the liturgy and all of the other mysteries or the graces while reading in the church the law and the prophets. It, it was not making the church any weaker. 
In fact, as I always say, that when you have an event that's talked about throughout thousands of years before, it makes it more valid than writing after about it after it, which is the beauty of the law of the prophets to emphasize Christianity even more than the, uh, the writings of the New Testament. You know, of course, we're not saying it's not important, but it's very, very validation of this has to be the incarnation. So you see that the, the, these people who don't have a father of confession, they don't have communion, they don't have a church to turn to, but just the amount of faith they have um, without all of the things we enjoy just makes us, we have to read and learn and ask for the prayers of Judas whenever we fall in trouble. This is lady is just iron lady. Is, 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 she's going to set the rulers in place and she will solve the problem by the work of God. Therefore, my brothers, let us set an example. It's just amazing. For our kindred, for their lives depend upon us. See something in the church? You cannot say, oh, just let me talk to somebody. This is somebody's problem. To, what, what, the, the harvest is many, but the labors are few. Why can't you solve it? Why can't you help with it? Um, complaining is not a problem, is, is not a, an attitude of a Christian person. Um, and very often um, we become more leaders than doers or servants that hiddenly I can go and fix something there's something in the bathroom that needs to to be cleaned why can I can't I do it this is my church why can't I leave my place clean so so many many things that on a personal level God notices that you take a, you take a hidden angle in it and you go fix it instead of complaining about it both the temple and the altar, this is, uh, shows very much, they are still erected there, rests upon us. Both the temple and the altar rests upon us. And she's not a priest, she's not as officer, she's not part of the Levites, she's a true parishioner. In spite of everything, let us give, <laughs> this is amazing, let us give thanks to the Lord our God who's putting us to the test as he did our ancestors. Remember what he did with Abraham and how he tested Isaac and what happened to Jacob in Syrian Mesopotamia. Jacob went to Laban, by the way. This is Syrian Mesopotamia when Jacob went to Laban and he had to work extra hard in order to get Leah. While he was tending the sheep of Laban, here it is, I should have just told <laughs> His mother's brother. For he has not tried us with fire, as he did them to search their hearts. Nor has he taken vengeance on us, but the Lord scourges those who are close to him in order to admonish them. So that we're not judged in the final judgment with people. If you get your judgment here in the form of difficulty, you're going to see how much that pays off on the final. It says, yeah, all your mistakes, I punished you for it on earth. Thank you, God. Please punish me. Punishment of God is different than the people. Punishment of God just hugs the person, maybe squeezes a little bit, but he's, he's holding the person. You are not abandoned. So when you feel that God is punishing you, equals, God is taking care of me. That's exactly the definition. How is she giving that the regulation they are in, she considers it much less than... than of course, then Abraham was Isaac, definitely. But it's not less than, than, than uh, Jacob's. This is tougher than Jacob's. Jacob was not captive. Jacob didn't have his life in danger. So, but she's just not a complainer. A perfect personality. Really, really, Judith is a perfect personality. And, and she's sinless. Figuratively speaking, of course. Yes. Then Uzziah said to her, All that you have said was spoken out of a true heart, and there is no one who can deny your words. Today is not the first time your wisdom has been shown. That's why when Judith called for them, he immediately went. This lady is a lady that's worth listening to. But from the beginning of your life, all your people, all the people have recognized your understanding, for your heart's disposition is right. But the people were so thirsty that they were 
that they compelled us. So now here the excuse comes. Valid one. The people were so thirsty that they compelled us to do for them what we have promised and made us take an oath that we cannot break. Now since you are a God-fearing woman, pray for us so that the Lord may send us rain. Yeah, that would be a solution. To fill our cisterns. Containers. Then we will no longer feel faint from thirst. It's a miserable condition. And Judas is suffering the same. Then Judas said to them, listen to me. I'm about to do something that will go down through all generations of our people. Stand at the town gate tonight so that I may go out with my name because the town is sealed. And within the days after which you have promised to surrender the town to our enemies, the Lord will deliver Israel by my hand. Only do not try to find out what I'm doing. For I will not tell you until I have finished what I'm about to do. She has something in her mind. She already planned it. And she will just tell them, let me go out and close the city again. And don't ask me what I'm going to do. Or she's trusting that God will send her an idea to do it. She's just telling them, don't ask me what I'm going to do. But see, yeah, amazing, amazing faith. Hosea and the ruler said to her, go in peace and may the Lord God go before you to take vengeance on our enemies. So they returned from the tent and went to their posts. Chapter 9. Then Judith prostrated herself, put ashes on her head, and uncovered the sackcloth she was wearing. At the very time when the evening incense was being offered in the house of God in Jerusalem, another support that the temple was still erected, Judith cried out to the Lord within a loud voice. Incense is offered, by the way, in, in, in evening and in matins. And that's where we get the raising of incense. And in, in Exodus, it is said by God, you have to offer to me a burnt offering from the morning till the evening and another burnt offering from the evening till the morning. This is so that anybody, would imagine you wake up at night in, 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 in the desert and you look at the tabernacle, there's always on the burnt offering altar, because nothing happens in the incense altar except when they sacrifice the sin offering, um, and when David later on put it, uh, divisions for who offers incense there, you wake up and you see this, this temple, there's a sacrifice on it, and that's a symbol of the Christ on the cross. There's always Christ on the cross. So anybody who wakes up at any point, time of the night or on the day, there is a, 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 an offering burning on the uh, bronze bronze altar or the burnt offering altar or the altar basically that's outside of the sanctuary it's in the outer court of the tabernacle uh, uh, Bernard, it's like why do we say like in like psalm 50 like you do not delight in the burnt offering because the lord is looking now for the heart and at some point the offerings were offered and he said i, I can't stand the offerings at your offerings anymore just i'm turning my face away from it from your feast from anything. If you read Jeremiah and Isaiah, God is like, they are doing these things and their, their heart is never with God. So it's just said... God this accept is, this? Hmm? God won't accept this? God won't accept the offering if my heart is hypocritical. So that's why he's telling them that, that God is not pleased with the offering, now he's pleased with the contrite heart. Mm -hmm. The contrite heart and the broken heart, this is the true offering. If you do an offering with this heart, of course, God, God loves it. But if you do an offering and your heart is hypocritical, uh, then, then God says, I, I, I don't want it anymore. So this is why God is very, very big on us. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. This is, this is why he said that uh, you, God is not pleased with the animals offered if they don't think of, of any repentance. So, but, but he put this system, um, the word God planned approaching him in the Old Testament as a shadow of how we're going to unite with him in the New Testament. That's actually in the book of Song of Solomon, the, the marriage between two, which is the relationship between us and God in the Eucharist. 
um, is not mentioned the sacrifice mentioned in the book of love a fair relationship between the bride and the bridegroom in in, in let him kiss me in the kisses of his mouth this is really the eucharist the fulfillment of love in the chamber of the altar where, where us and god physically unite in the um, abides in me and i in him so let's does that answer it yeah Let's continue a little bit in this chapter. Maybe we can finish it. Just uh, we'll be well, lit. well, one thing is like so. Even if like like our heart is not contrived and it's like seen as a like hypocrisy, like if the burnt offering is seen as Christ, I don't know. It's just like a, how can like the 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 sacrifice of the offering that's like a symbol of Christ be not in the delight of the Lord? I guess that's what, but I kinda, I, it I, says about it a, a sweet aroma to the Lord. When all of the sacrifices are actually, it, it always there is a sentence that comes with it. Ra'ihat surur rab, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Sacrifices are being offered. It's a symbolism to Christ on the cross, especially the burnt offering. But the attitude of the people doing it, they are hypocrites. So God said, <laughs> yeah. you're just bringing me something just to, as a check mark. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't have any any change in your behavior. So that's why. Um, o Lord God of my ancestor Simeon, now comes the value of this part that I, some reason, I don't know if I have a time out on <laughs> even when we read this part here. So Sarasadai, son of Simeon, son of Israel, in the in the in the print that we have, it's Sarasadai, son of Israel directly. So it shows here, it's caught up in another place that she's calling on her ancestor Simeon because Judas is daughter of so and so and so and so and so, daughter of Simeon, daughter of Israel, daughter of Jacob. Simeon in Arabic is who? Uh, Shamon. Yep. Yeah, Coptic reader has both. And the, and the Coptic reader? You don't well, have I have downloaded it. I have it here. Coptic. I have a, a full Arabic book for the second canonical books mm -hmm. in my trunk. <laughs> so next time I'll bring it with you. I can, you can have a physical book. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, after this, I think the only cup to create it, then it has... So it says God of my father, Simeon. Is that what you were wondering? No, no, no. I, I'm just saying, uh, in the beginning, when you read the genealogy of Judas, it doesn't mention Simeon. It mentions Saradai, and then son of Israel, directly. But in this print, in this print here, which disappears on its own, it just has a find out for some reason. New Advent, New American Bible by um, it's a Vatican. They add this. What does the Orthodox Bible say? It? it says the same thing. It says the same thing. It says what? It says, it, says, it, says, it, says, it, says, it doesn't say, it doesn't say see me? No, it just says, Sarah uh, Sadai? Yeah. yeah, son of Sarah Sadai, son of Israel. Yeah. Oh. And like the the commentary says, like it's on purpose to show that it's to all of Israel, not like one person or one tribe or anything. Oh, not to limit it to Simeon. Like basically, all Israel would benefit from this. I'm just asking about the names to link both languages together. Mm. Uh, I think I'm the only one who speaks Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I said here, Ibn Shamoun, Ibn Ra'ubi. This one is so much. But here it said Ibn Sham Israel. It's here it said Ra'ubi. I don't know. Ra'ubi? No, yeah. And the Coptic reader it said Ra'ubi. What's the application? Coptic reader? It's almost a typo. <laughs> yeah, I know that's what I was asking. Is it a typo or what's going on? 
Uh, as I said at the beginning, there could be errors in the manuscripts that doesn't make the, 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 the events, I don't want to say story, the events futile or have no meaning because all of the context of the prayer, all of the context of what Joseph is talking about matches completely all of the other personalities of the Bible. Like they just accidentally left out Simeon because she automatically alludes to Simeon in that verse. My ancestors, so it should be there, right? She said, My ancestor Simeon. She mentioned yeah. that she's from the lineage of Simeon. Exactly. So I don't know why Ruben is just all of a sudden there. Ruben? <laughs> yeah, but this is the, now this is a completely. <laughs> this is another one. We call it outliers. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, that it, Yanni. It's good. To, I, 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 keep, I keep emphasizing that errors like this does not diminish the Bible, especially in the second. The second canonical have. Can we call errors. it error? Hmm? Is it an error? Scripture, scribe error, or different sources that they're writing from them. These books are written after many facts that happened for Asr al Maccabeeen. probably. Yeah. Um, the Catholics differ a little bit on a couple of them. Esdras, two Esdras, they have it and we don't have it. Um, so, so these are beneficial because it matches the spirit of the Bible, but we don't consider it as inspired. What's written in it is very matching the repentance, the deliverance, the, 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 the Judith is, I don't know why it's not part of it put in uh, Bright Saturday, it's just one of the best deliverance things, but that could be... Um, uh, I wrote down the, such a question. Why it's not included in the first place? Mm. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you saying that like all the deuterocanonical books are considered not inspired? All? Like we don't, we, it's not given the same level of inspiration like the, the, the original ones. Especially right. that they're written much later and probably written in Greek. Yeah, right. So, not as the original Hebrew right? Mm -hmm. but they are put because their spirit completely matches the spirit of the Old Testament, the deliverance of God in What other cults confess the presence of such chapters? Catholics. Protestant law? O Lord God of my ancestors, my ancestor, sorry, my ancestor Simeon, to whom you give a sword to take revenge on those strangers who had torn off a virgin's clothing to defile her and expose her thighs, to put her to shame and profane her womb to disgrace her, for you said, I shall not, it shall not be done. Yet they did it, so they gave up their rulers to be killed, and their bed, which was ashamed of the deceit they had practiced, was stained with blood, and you struck down slaves along with princes, and princes on their thrones. You gave up their wives for plunder and their daughters to captivity and all their spoils to divide, to be divided among your beloved children who burned with zeal for you and abhorred the pollution of their blood and called on you for help. So some of the tribes, the tribes of the north, has committed a lot of sins. So Judas is saying that you have allow this to happen to them because they have committed a lot of sins with the division of the kingdom um, and these tribes have uh, went astray unfortunately so they fell into the hand of holy furnace easily and unfortunately these armies don't spare the women and the children and she's asking that this doesn't happen to, to them because the kingdom of Judah tried to be very, very holy and they have the temple and they did not go after strange gods, which is the kingdom of Israel has done. So she's reminding God that, oh God, my God, hear me also a widow. Like I'm the least strong among these armies and men and anything. For you have done these things and those that went before and those that followed, you have designed the things that are now and those that are to come. What you had in mind has happened. The things you decided on presented themselves and said, here we are. For all your ways are prepared in advance, and your judgment is with foreknowledge. 
Here now are the Assyrians, a greatly increased force, priding themselves in their horses and riders, boasting in the strength of the foot soldiers and trusting in shield and spear, in bow and sling. You do not know that you are the Lord who crushes wars. The Lord is your name. Break the strength by your might and bring down the power in your anger. For they intend to profane your sanctuary and to pollute the tabernacle where your glorious name resides and to break off the horns of your altar with the sword. Look at their pride and send your wrath upon their heads. Give to me a widow, the strong hand to do what I plan. By the deceit of my lips, strike down the slave with the prince and the prince with his attendant and crush the arrogance by the hand of woman. For your strength does not depend on numbers, nor your might on the powerful, but you are the God of the lowly, looks upon the lowly, as we'll say in the liturgy, helper of the oppressed, upholder of the weak, protector of the forsaken, savior of those without hope. This puts us with St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapters 11 and 12. And he says, for, for then when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I will, boast in, I will boast in my infirmity that the power of Christ will come upon me. أفتخر بالحرية في الأفات التي تحل على قوت المسيح حينما أنا ضعيف حين يزعم القوة Please, please, God of my Father, God of the heritage of Israel, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, king of all your creation, hear my prayer. Make my deceitful words, what are the, what are the deceitful words? The words that you will use with in the future, you will see what happens. Bring wound and bruise on those who have planned cruel things against your covenant and against your sacred house and against Mount Zion and against the house your children possess. Let your whole nation and every tribe know and understand that you are God, the God of all power and might, and there is no other who protects the people of Israel. Now the people of Israel is all of us who are called the new Israel Christians. But you are, but you are. I, I encourage you very much that at work and in any difficulty that you just open up the prayer of this uh, widow. Widow, yeah, that means that she has no support. The, the widow of the son of Nain, or the widow of Nain, her son died and she's a widow, so just, she's going to be, nobody will, will take care of her. And the Lord raised him up. So it's, a, it's maybe financially well taken care of widow, but mentally uh, her money is not what saves her. She didn't say, oh, my inheritance, I need to just find a new land. No, she just saw, she, 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 she pro pro collected the people and gave them encouragement. Why, why did you make the people uh, feel that they're going to be delivered? Huh? Within five days, even if it hasn't happened, God will have a way of deliverance. Um, so it's, uh, and they thought the human thinking, he will bring rain. Again, 200 denarii will not be enough to feed these people, even if anybody takes a little, a little bit of the human, human thing, which God doesn't mind because it's, it says in the John 6 specifically that God asked Philip, but God was knowing what he will do. But he told Philip, what are we going to do with these people? But St. John, to emphasize the divinity of Christ, he put there, no, no, God knew what, he, what God was going to do. He just asked Philip to show us that we have weakness, but the disciples had, had honor. They, they, they just suggested something. Like, for example, when St. Andrew, the brother of St. Peter says, here is a lad who had five loaves and two fish. He's Ooh. proposing something that's impossible to feed these, so, but he, he offers whatever is available. That shows the faith, because he would look at this without just no, no, it would be stupid to say a sentence like this. He didn't. He said it. He said it. God, all what's here is this lad that has five loaves and two fish, and he knows very well that's not enough. 
but he did not shy away from appearing stupid. Not shy away from appearing that what are we talking about? But in God's these are the things that God was looking for, that the disciple had the simplicity. Whatever is in the hand they will offer. And that takes a strong strength of character and knowing that I can put limit to my thinking. I can put limit to what logically could happen because God is, is, is this is what, what miracles are, is beyond the logic. But what, what, but when it comes to the faith, he gave us a logical faith. But when it comes, logic it stops only when there is a miracle. But in the faith, God asked us to employ our mind because our faith is very, very logical and and makes sense to, to, to his children, the humans. We'll, uh, we'll continue next week and, and, and then you might uh, find it interesting how Judas will... Uh, yeah, we'll it is. The words. <laughs> hmm? we, we need to know. No. You can read it on your own if you want to know ahead, but I think it's good to come and have this background music and, uh, <laughs> and the questions and answers and uh, to, to get to see it together uh, what will happen. We should ask for her prayers. We should ask really for Judas' prayers. She's remarkable. Okay, let's get together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Son, and every person, and the Son, and the Son. intercession of St. Mary, Lord, and the prayers of Judas, and the prayers of St. Maria, and the Holy Youth, hear us when we call upon your thanks to our Father, who art in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but let us know the name of the Christ, the Son of God, and the King of God, and the Holy Spirit. And go in peace and the peace of God be with you. Christus and his name. It's great to be here, I think. It's to have you there. I think you're all in 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 there.